Welcome to Reach, the real estate education channel brought to you by Sparks Blackthorn Capital, where your host, attorney, and real estate advisor, Lee Cowden, offers up tips, strategies, and real estate investment know-how exclusively for passive investors. Looking for ways to increase your monthly income and minimize taxes? Are you ready to live financially free using passive real estate investments? Then get ready, because here comes another incredible episode on the Real Estate Education Channel. Now, here's your host, Lee Cowden. Thank you for joining me here on Reach, the Real Estate Education Channel. I am Lee Cowden, your host. And I'm here today interviewing Sean Winslow of Greenbrier Capital Group. I'm going to give you his bio real quick, and then we're going to jump right into these questions I have for him. Sean Winslow is the founder and managing partner of Greenbrier Capital Group. He has an aptitude for investing in multifamily apartments, providing his clients with significant passive income and generational wealth creation. His passion is helping his investors achieve financial freedom by reducing their dependency on conventional income and investments such as stocks, bonds, and 401k plans so they can pursue their own dreams. In addition to pursuing attractive risk-adjusted returns for his investors, Sean strives to enhance the life of every tenant, team member, and individual that comes into contact with Greenbrier and its partners. Sean has an undergraduate degree from the Questrom School of Business focusing on finance and has completed the real estate finance program at Boston University. Prior to founding Greenbrier Capital Group, Sean worked for one of the top 10 largest investment firms in the world. His passion for helping others pursue their financial goals started here by bringing in over $1.5 billion in assets. That's billion, not million. (laughs) His experience has given him an expertise in data analysis, industry and market conditions, business risks, and projected financial statements that provide him a competitive advantage in property acquisitions. And that's the end of the bio, but I got one question right off the bat. How old are you, Sean? I am 30 years old. Oh my gosh. That's a lot to accomplish in that short of a period of of working lifetime. So congratulations to you. Thank you. There's much more to go though. (laughs) Absolutely. So Tell us just a little bit, maybe something that wasn't included in the bio that you think our listeners might want to know about you. Yeah, well, first of all, Lee, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on here, a real honor, and I'm excited to talk some real estate. Um, So I grew up in a small town in Vermont. Um, Like most millennials, I was brought up where you do well in high school, then you get to go to a great college, you do well in college, and then you get a great W-2 job. But I was also brought up in a family of entrepreneurs. So there was this weird juxtaposition where I'm supposed to go to college, but then I'm brought up by entrepreneurs. And I also was taught that if I ever wanted anything, I had to work for it. So I had a lawn care business, a snow removal business when I was young. And I'm just very fortunate to have a family that brought me up with those, um, that work ethic and those values. And so, however, I still decided to go the college route, which brought me to Boston, studied finance, and which led me to the, my W-2 job, which Lee mentioned in my bio. It was the seventh largest, at the time, it was the seventh largest money manager on Wall Street. But after eight years, I realized three things, three major things. The first is I was trading time for money. The second is I was working hard for someone else's dream and not my own. And then third, which is the most important to me, is my values did not align with the product that I was um, representing. Okay, you said something interesting there, and it wasn't part of my questionnaire that I sent you prior to this interview, but I want you to give us a little bit more on this trading time for money. What do you mean by that? Essentially, you know, you show up for your nine to five job and you're getting paid to be there. So if you're not there, you're not going to get paid. If you don't show up, there's no paycheck at the end, end of the month or end of this second week. So, and then the, also the working for someone else's dream, you know, that's, if you're going to pour blood, sweat and, and tears into something, you've, it's got to be, to me, it's got to be your passion. Now I know entrepreneurship isn't for everyone, but that was just how I felt at the time. 
And then especially the whole value thing, the products that we represented were to help individuals and families grow their nest egg. But these products were not tax efficient and they were very costly. So to me, it just didn't align with my values. It was something that I personally wouldn't use. So I didn't feel right representing a company that I personally wouldn't use. I can totally appreciate that. I was talking to Corey Peterson, a gentleman that we will speak about during this interview, who is the reason why you and I made our connection. But we were, we were both financial planners and financial advisors in our past, similar to you, but he worked at Edward Jones and I worked at another full service brokerage. And we both ran into the same issues where our clients had goals, but our company also had goals and those goals were not necessarily aligned. So some people can just stick with that and make it work for them and other people, they gain the knowledge, the financial background and that, but they just can't continue on with it. And it sounds like you, Corey and I are all kind of in the same boat there. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with these questions that I have. The title of this podcast is Sean Winslow, A Millennial's Vision for Real Estate Investing. And Sean and I together are in a mastermind group with several other individuals. And Sean is the youngest member of our group, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe John is a little bit younger than you, or maybe not. I'm not sure. But anyway, Sean's focus is on educating millennials and investing for what Sean was describing as passive income. So tell us what brought you to multifamily investing. It goes back to what I was talking about. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. One of my heroes was my grandfather. Um, he ran, he built and ran many successful businesses. They were different, but one thing always remained the same is that he owned the real estate that the business occupied. And one day he told me that the real estate was his retirement. And that was my first aha moment. I was like, wait, you can sit back in retirement and still collect checks. Like I'm not talking about like social security size checks. I'm talking about checks where your life does not change whatsoever. And that was the first aha moment. But I think I had still had, I definitely still had limiting beliefs where I felt like I don't know enough. Am I the right type of person? Don't you need large amounts of capital to do this? So I continued on in the, my W2, or my college and W2 kind of trajectory. And then probably a few years later, my grandfather sent me a book. And the book, which I'm sure many listeners have read, is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that was the big aha moment where I realized I was trading time for money, that there's an alternative. And so I invested in a program at Boston University, which you mentioned before, to learn real estate finance. And that's through that, that's how I found multifamily. Okay, so how does your background help you to add value for your clients in this market? Well, with my background, I think I'm able to, well, I know I'm able to pull back the proverbial curtain when it comes to financial services. Now, I'm not trying to paint a picture here to make this, the industry sound terrible or evil because it's not, but there's a lot of stuff that is not, told to investors and I feel I'm able to provide that value for my clients. And I don't know if you want to get into the details of things, but we're talking about hidden fees. What about be in your 401k, your IRA, or the securities themselves, like mutual funds and ETFs? Um, it's just not, to me, that's where my, my values didn't align. And on top of that, I want to also talk about a common term we hear as investors in the market and that's average return. This is something I also teach my investors is that when you're quoted an average return, you think so for instance, since 2000 to 2019, S&P 500 had an average return of 7.56%. And so as an investor, you think, okay, well that's what I'm going to get in my bank account after those 20 years. And you know, 
yeah, why wouldn't you think that? But that is not correct. And that has to do with just basic math. We were taught average is when you take, say you have five numbers, you add those five numbers up and you divide by five and that's your average. But what that doesn't take into consideration is compounding interest. What happens between those periods, especially when you have negative returns. So if you had $100,000 that you invested and the market went down 10% and you're invested in the S&P 500, and this is not even taking into account fees, which would diminish your return even more, but you would be at $90,000 because you'd have lost 10%. Well, if the market goes up 10% the next year, you would not be back whole. You would still be missing $1,000. And so over 20 years of volatility in the market, the market going up and the market going down, you're not actually going to have that average return. But if you were to have a fixed return of that 7.56, and you were to look at those same 20 years, you actually have over $1.4 million more in your account. That's right, $1.4 million more. And that's not even taking into account your fee you're paying your advisor, the fee you're paying on the underlying security, and then if it's in a retirement or 401k, 401k account, the fees that you're paying for that. So my background, I'm able to provide that knowledge, and at the same time, as you know, Lee, one of the big pushbacks we get when we're talking about real estate to prospective investors is, well, I got to run this by my advisor. Well, in my career, and, and same as your former career, is we're able to relate and we know what that pushback is going to be. So I feel like I'm able to provide um, a knowledge to my investors from both sides so they can see you know, both options. That's brilliant. I mean, knowledge is power, right? And I'm embarrassed to say, but I feel like I have to confess in all the years that I was a financial advisor or stockbroker, I quoted those average returns with full intention of people thinking that's was going to be what their return was going to be because I did not ever do that calculation that you just did for us. And I'm just gonna go over it again real quickly because this, this is huge, but I'm gonna use a million dollars because sometimes the bigger numbers are easier to see what we're talking about. So if you invested a million dollars in that fund that you suggested or that you're talking about, you didn't suggest it, and you lose 10% in year one, your new balance is $900,000. So you've lost 10% of your portfolio value of $100,000. Next year, return goes back up. 10%. So there is a zero net loss as far as the return is concerned that you'll be quoted. But you will have only started that second year at $900,000. So a 10% increase in your portfolio value is only a $90,000 increase. So your new value is $990,000 at the end of year two. So although the return shows zero loss, you're actually down $10,000 in your portfolio. So that is not something I ever fully appreciated when I was teaching people and guiding people in investing in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and so on. And, and that's, that's awful. I'm, so, I'm sorry to jump that. It is awful and that's powerful, but it's something I didn't notice when I first started. And the reason for that is because these firms, these financial services firms are like casinos. They want the money to stay in the house. So they can't let you know that. And they don't even want their own employees to know that because the money needs to stay in the house. And how I discovered this, which is kind of funny, is my firm put out a marketing piece, which highlighted arithmetic average or arithmetic mean versus um, geometric mean, which is essentially what we're talking about. And I was like, wait, what? Why, why is this account that has the same average return having a higher ending balance? Then I just did you know, a quick Google search and, and yeah, I found the answer. And I, it's, it's kind of funny that the house that wants the money, that, that secret to stay there is uh, the one who gave me the answer. Yeah, well, that probably wasn't a piece they wanted you to share too widely. Um, okay, so we've been talking about your interest in multifamily investing and how your background can help you add value to your clients in this market. Is there any other type of investing of commercial real estate or other asset class that appeals to you? And if so, why does it appeal to you? Yeah. Um, 
multi, as you know, just like yourself, multifamily is my focus, but that doesn't mean there isn't any other investments out there. I actually really love self storage. And I think you, you and I have had this conversation in the past. It's similar to, to multifamily in terms of, you know, you have several units and in one area, unlike single family investing. But what really drew me in is the numbers because my background numbers are important to me. So I'm just going to pull up some numbers here and just read this to you. So in, during the recession, I have returns here. The S&P 500 was down over 30%. MBS, which is mortgage-backed securities, were down 11.5%. Multifamily did a lot better. It was only down about 6%. And self-storage was only down 3.8%. And then if we look from 1994 to 2017, the S&P 500 had, had, here we go again, an average return of 7.5%. MBS had an average return of 11, this is average annual return of 11%. Multifamily had an average return of 13.3%. That's really good. And self-storage had an average return of 17%. So just from a number standpoint, self-storage makes a lot of sense to me, but it's also the fact that there's no tenant laws. So you don't have to evict anyone. You know, like when, we, when we're doing due diligence, we like states that aren't strict on landlords. So eviction that won't take you, you know, a year and a half to evict someone who's not paying. But with self-storage, you don't have to worry about that. If, if someone doesn't pay, by the second day, you're slapping on, you know, a lock on their unit until they pay you. And if they don't pay you within, you know, the, the remainder of the month, you have, you have someone coming in to auction off their, uh, their belongings, just like uh, storage wars, and you're, you end up making the same, if not more, than what you were bringing in from rent. So from a risk standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. So that's definitely an asset that I've also been looking at and will um, continue to look at. And another thing is, as we know, multifamily is very competitive right now. It's, you know, it's the, the hot topic, the buzzword. So it makes it very hard to find a deal that, at a certain value, whereas self storage, if we look, if we look at this, only 18% of facilities are owned by the top institutional buyers. And that's about, I think that's around six institutional buyers. The next top 100 um, f facility owners, operators is 8%. They own 8% of the facilities and the remaining 74% of self storage facilities are owned by mom and pop owners. And these are people that are having it, you know, as a, as a second stream of income. It's not their primary job. And they don't sell through brokers. So this is really easy just to reach out, you know, with a mailer, with an email, with a call. So that's, that's why I really like that um, asset class. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I really love the lower risk and the, I don't know, ease of management, I think that comes in that asset class. And it's definitely something that I look at as well. So as a millennial, Sean, how do you view the market? So we're talking about the outlook for 2020 and beyond. And what are you going to do to capitalize on that vision? Mm -hmm. Well, if you listen to the news, read the news, you probably don't know where the market's going to go. And I don't think anyone ever does but there's a lot of negativity out there. It's, you're, you're, you're either hearing the market's going to crash or another recession, or it's going to another year of all time highs. But this is a reason I love multifamily is it doesn't really matter what the market does. As long as you're not over leveraged or, you know, doing anything you shouldn't be doing, you're still going to be able to collect the rent checks every month. And if you're in the right type of asset, you get the trickle down effect. So, you know, if, if you're buying class A properties, you know, there might be some risk in a, in a downturn, but if you're in, in B, C class properties, you're going to get the trickle down effect where people in A class can no longer afford that. So they're going to trickle down to your properties. So I'm not really worried too much about the market. If, if I had all my money in stocks, <laughs> yeah, I, I would be, but um, yeah, I, I'm very positive about the outlook on multifamily. We're seeing all these reports where we have lenders that are saying they're gonna be lending at all time highs this year. We have development, we have 
supply that is not meeting demand. So I'm very bullish on multifamily for the next year or two. And are you feeling the same way about self-storage? Yes, because okay. as, as we develop these apartments in major cities, they're getting smaller and smaller. So people need place to store their stuff. And then also baby boomers, the second largest generation are downsizing or they're transferring from home ownership into um, apartment living, renting. So they, they're gonna need storage as well. Okay. So what kind of concerns do millennials have with regard to finances, wealth and lifestyle that you think other generations might not or that might be different from previous generations? Well, the first thing is the student loan crisis. So some people call it a crisis. I, I, I do think it could lead to that. At $1.4, $1.5 trillion in student loan debt. And the way these things are set up is that, for instance, if you had a, a minimum payment of $100 a month, but the interest for that month was $200, it would only cover $100. So then you're, you still have interest that is building on top of more interest and you're just digging a deeper hole for yourself. So I think that's a, a huge risk for millennials, ones that previous generations have not faced, um, at least not to this level. Also, this, this ends up inevitably meaning that most millennials cannot afford to buy a home. And as we know, that's a big part of the American dream, whether you agree with it or not. Like that's another debate for another topic, but that, that's, you know, a situation where they're not going to be able to probably buy a house for the foreseeable future because of their student loan debt. So those are probably two main things. Also, millennials, when it comes to lifestyle, we like to be able to, we love travel. We like to be, you know, flexible. So that, that's another reason why I love multifamily is because the biggest generation loves either they have no choice but to rent or they prefer to rent so they can be flexible. So yeah. That's, that's why I love multifamily when it comes to millennials as well. I read a statistic at some point that said millennials change jobs three times more frequently than other generations. So it seems to me, and you can agree or disagree, that this also contributes to millennials preferring to rent over own. I definitely agree with that. Um, I was not part of that norm. I, I had my job for, my previous job, I was there for eight years, but while I was there, I saw plenty of millennials jump ship or, or come from other places, leave to go to other places. You're talking about some people under a year, some people a year to three years. So that's definitely a very valid point. And in your experience, so you were working in Boston, a big city. Were these people just moving around the city or were they moving to other states? Mostly the city, but you definitely get people moving to other states. And then even people that didn't leave the company but got repositioned to other parts of the country, they would start off renting too because they're going to a new area. They want to check it out before they you know, buy anything. How long are they going to be there? So yeah, definitely. And then it was also because cost of living is getting so expensive. People would have to move to other parts of the city so they could you know, not spend all their money on rent. Right. Okay. So Let's see, what does a millennial real estate expert like you have to offer that's special or unique? I think it's one, it's what we talked about earlier, just my background, how I can, you know, relate to both traditional investing and then multifamily investing. And I can kind of, I'm not here to say that you should put all your eggs in one basket because I don't believe in that. I believe in diversification not the diversification that our advisors like to tell us just buy more stocks and bonds, you know, differentiate by different sectors, by different parts of the world. No, that's, if you look at the numbers, if you own one stock, a standard deviation, which is a measure of, a me, excuse me, a measure of risk is about 42. If you had a hundred stocks, that measure is about 20. And if you had a thousand stocks, that measure, that standard deviation measure is ni about 19. So you're not really getting much diversification through adding more stocks. And if you own a thousand stocks, you can't tell me that you're, you intimately know all those companies the way you should. And so I, as a millennial, I'm here to educate in that sense when it comes to 
you know, diversifying in other asset classes like real estate. And even when it comes to real estate, it doesn't have to be multifamily, but you should have healthy diversification. So I feel like I'm able to, as a millennial, I'm able to bring that. And I'm also, as a millennial myself, I know the trends. I know the lifestyle that millennials want to live, where they want to live, what amenities they want. So I, I, I can offer that as well. There's one thing that jumps out to me about millennials too, because I have millennial children. I'm 51, full disclosure. I have kids in, in their 20s. You don't look it. Ah, you <laughs> win. Favorite interviewing ever. Even though you're only my first one, I'm sure you'll Ooh. remain my favorite for a very long time just for that. But <laughs> I can contest to the fact that my kids as millennials seem to be much more savvy with respect to technology and their trust in technology. What do you think about that? Oh, I completely agree. You know, they, a millennial can just live their whole life on their phone, whether that's healthy or not. We can talk about that at another time, but literally everything goes through that phone. They don't even really need a laptop anymore. And some of these A-class properties run everything through the phone as well. You know, you can order a maintenance man through your phone. You can pay your rent through your phone. Um, you're notified when you have a package delivered. You can set up dry cleaning. So yeah, millennials do love the convenience factor. And you're definitely seeing that being added into some of these, um, you know, luxury apartments, A-class properties. Okay. So we chatted a little bit before the interview about a chart that a friend of ours sent over and I'm going to make this chart available or a link to the article that the chart is in, in the show notes. But there was a couple aspects that we were going to chat about. So this chart was comparing millennials to boomers, basically. And one of the areas they were measuring was, I am optimistic about investment opportunities. And the boomers were at 66% in agreement, very confident with that statement. Whereas millennials were 49% and there was neither confident nor concerned. So they're kind of in the middle there. What, what do you, um, how do you explain that, I guess? Well, I can definitely see why that's the case. Uh, majority of millennials during the financial crisis were either just starting their careers or they were looking for careers or in college. So they lived through it and that's all they really know when it comes to markets. Whereas, you know, older generations like the boomers, they live through many different market cycles. Um, whereas that's the one that's the most fresh in our mind. So I think millennials are a little more skeptical, especially with what's come out about some of the big banks and kind of the practices that they were playing that there's a lot of these millennials don't, there's like a lot, there's a lack of trust to, We'll say. Okay. And there's another one on this chart. I'm going to pull it up here that showed a big disparity between the two groups. I like to manage all personal finance, including investments in the same app. 66% of boomers agreed very confidently with that statement, whereas only 35% of millennials felt the same way. I, I agree with that. Um, well, I can see that at least because it goes back to what we were talking about before is they run everything through their phones. If you, you know, talking about social media, there's not just one app that is all of social media. There's several. So they're very comfortable with running um, on different platforms. Yeah, I will say I really do like an all-in-one program. When I'm looking for things for my business, I'm, I'm always like, well, can I connect it and just do it all in one place? And right. Oftentimes the answer is no. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to have to learn another thing, you know? And yeah. maybe if you're 30, that's like a fun challenge. But when you're 51, you're like, I think my hard drive is getting full. I'm not sure I have enough room to put another chunk of information in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just have a few more questions. Now these are a little more about your business and maybe even a little touchy feely type question. So are you okay. ready? I'm ready. Ready. So what is your focus for your business right now? What are you doing day to day? Yeah. So my focus is educating my investors and potential investors. It's the reason why I originally got into finance, like I said before, was to help others achieve their financial freedom. And I believe multifamily is the best way to do that. So 
right now in meeting with my investors, potential investors to educate them and help them achieve those goals. I'm, I'm looking to both build relationships, both with my investors and also with brokers and my partners on, on deals, because I, I feel those are the most important aspects of what we do, Lee, is, you know, we need strong relationships. We need to know, like, and trust the people we're doing business with. So right now I'm focused on cultivating all those relationships. Okay. So you said invest current and future investors, brokers, and then partners. These are people who you would be involved in deals with. As well. Correct. Partners. Okay. Excellent. So you mentioned in the very beginning of your interview here, just after I read your bio about limiting beliefs. And so I wanted to ask you, how much do you feel mindset has to do with being successful in this or any business? I'd say it's 90% of everything we do, maybe even higher. Um, Cause yeah, like my statement earlier, that limiting belief, it kept me stuck. I, I was, educating myself, but I wasn't taking action. And that's the biggest thing. You just have to believe in yourself and take action. And it's actually funny that you asked that question. I'm actually reading a book right now called Mindset. It's by a Dr. Carol Dweck. Um, and I believe it's a book that every single person on this planet should read. I, I feel like it should be a book that's um, in the curriculum of every single high school. It's, it, it's, shows you the contrast between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset and how important it is to have a growth mindset. And that will help eliminate those limiting beliefs. Excellent. Well, I, we're sharing resources now, so I'm going to go ahead and share the book I'm reading that I, I totally agree with you that you kind of said it and, and without saying it, that there's parts of the curriculum that high school students could really use that is just not there for them. And a lot of it is teaching them to believe in themselves, to have confidence, tools to help them get through the stressful periods of their lives. And believing in yourself is a huge piece of that. And another piece of it is listening to what other people tell you or say about you and learning what not to internalize and accept as a definition of you. And one of the best books that I have read in this particular area is called You're a Badass by Jennifer Sincero. And I'm listening to the audiobook actually, because I drive into Knoxville from my home, which is 30 minutes away every day. So that's an hour of windshield time. And I much prefer to listen to audiobooks or podcasts that can help me in my business because I feel like then I'm working while I'm driving. So um, you've, you've also mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, which I also read, which I think is really great for explaining why real estate is the best pathway to building legacy generational wealth. Um, and there's some brilliant concepts in there. We could spend hours and hours and hours talking about it, but we'll just put that on our list of resources. It'll be in the show notes. If anybody is looking at this on YouTube, you'll be able to see that there. Um, before we uh, finish, I got two more things I'm going to ask of you. First of all, I'd like you to give us your best advice or your best tip that we can use to help us reach our goals. That's the first one. I would say invest in yourself. Um, that's the most important part. And then seek out a mentor, a mentor like Lee and I did with Corey Peterson. He's been I don't want to put words in Lee's mouth, but he's probably been the best professional decision I've made and he adds rocket fuel to my career. So definitely invest in yourself, a mentor, and then take massive action because without action, it doesn't matter how much you invest in yourself, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. You know, I have a background in sales and sales is one of the hardest jobs in the world and you were bringing in capital so you were absolutely involved in sales yourself so you probably can appreciate this but because it's such a hard job people will do anything they can to avoid actually doing it so there was this stuff we used to call getting ready to get ready so it's one thing to go to conferences to listen to podcasts to reading books and just gathering all this data but it does you absolutely no good whatsoever unless you're ready to act on that data and become that person you're dreaming about. And the only way that happens is, like you said, through massive action. And you starting your podcast and me starting my podcast, this is one step forward for both of us. So I really appreciate you being on here. 
We're going to close with one last thing. I want you to give our audience your favorite quote for, for anything. It doesn't have to be business. It can be personal. What, what's your favorite quote? That's a tough one. There's a lot of good ones out there, but I think I'll go with kind of what we've been talking about the last 10 minutes or so when it comes to, you know, investing in yourself and growth mindset. I'm not sure where this originated from. A lot of people have kind of recycled this quote over times, but if you're not growing, you're dying. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being on, Sean. This is Sean Winslow from Greenbrier Capital Group out of Boston. Sean, tell us how we can find you. Yeah, so you can find me at, uh, it's Greenbrier, that's with an A, so G-R-E-E-N-B-R-I-A-R-C-G.com. And also the Millennial Millionaire Podcast. And you can find me on Facebook and Instagram as well. Excellent. Thanks so much for coming, Sean. I'll be seeing you in February. You will. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Absolutely. That wraps up another podcast episode of Reach, the real estate education channel brought to you by Sparks Blackthorn Capital. If you'd like to learn more about investing passively, please visit our website at www.sparksblackthorncapital.com. We have lots of free resources for you there and even a deal room where you can learn more about participating in any one of our upcoming projects as a passive investor. Sign up for our newsletter to receive a free book about passive investing and how to use retirement funds to invest in real estate. And before before you go offline, please don't forget to visit iTunes or wherever you download our podcast episodes from to leave us a review. Your reviews and comments help make our podcast available to other real estate investors just like you.